Welcome, everyone. Thank you for coming tonight to the Future SA Forum, Future San Antonio Forum. I want to start by giving a thanks to our sponsors, the San Antonio Apartment Association, Gray Street Partners, and Alamo Architects. And this event was produced by the organization San Antonio Neighborhoods for Everyone, Bike San Antonio, and My Urban SA. Um, my name is Jack Sanford. I'm going to just give a brief introduction to the evening and then hand it off to our moderator to lead the panel discussion. So why are we here? We wanted to throw this event because too often when the various parties that uh, have an opinion about infill development meet, it's in a public hearing where they might be forced to be in opposition to each other about a specific project. And there's not really time for a constructive dialogue when that happens. So what we wanted to do is provide that chance, to provide a chance for innovative housing developers to meet with people who are working hard to make, San, make sure San Antonio maintains the character that we all love. And we, we're really looking to address the issue of how do we house our next million people? Specifically, what part of that should be housed Central City? How do we maximize the number of people we can house in the Central City while maintaining the neighborhoods that we have, the character that we love? When we talk about info development, there's a lot of passionate headlines that get generated. People passionately oppose it or support it for various reasons. Many different viewpoints weigh in on this. You can see in the comments section on these articles, things like that. So some of the concerns about infill development, people who voice opposition to it, they often don't oppose infill development per se. But when a particular project comes up in their neighborhood, there can be a number of reasons that it's not appealing to them. It might not be compatible with the existing heights um, or the existing frontages, uh, the way that their char the character of their neighborhood or they might be afraid that it's going to create uh, inequality in housing um, or displacement. There's a lot of reasons uh, to support infill development. Um, people that support it generally look at broader issues that affect the entire city um, and really want San Antonio to take on a more urban feel. So uh, we designed tonight to hopefully get, give everyone a chance to have, uh, have a dialogue about this, to discuss this issue. The format's going to go, we have three main questions that we're going to ask our panel. We'll give 20 minutes for each. Um, and then we'll have time in between each one for audience questions about that. So hopefully we can generate a good conversation here. Um, in order to uh, facilitate audience participation, we do have some index cards going around. You might have gotten one when you walked in. If you more, um, you can ask Larry right here. If you write down your question, we'll take them all uh, during the panel discussion, and then a couple minutes before the panel, that question is done, we're going to stop taking them and we'll pick one out of a hat uh, to hand to our moderator to read and, and kind of introduce to the panel. We also have a live stream of this event going on um, online, and so when, if we get questions like that, we'll add those from that venue, we'll add those to the hat. We do ask that you play on, stay on topic to the question at hand and then aim for some constructive dialogue. Um, so without further ado, let me introduce Jim Bailey. Uh, he's an architect and associate principal at Alamo Architects, where he works primarily on infill and affordable housing projects. He's an inner city guy, a guerrilla planner, and smart growth proponent. He currently sits on the Housing Commission and the Mayor's Housing Policy Task Force that is charged with developing practical solutions for resilient neighborhoods and affordable housing. So please give a warm welcome to Jim Bailey. Thanks. We've all heard about the latest census data that says San Antonio was the fastest growing city in the nation from 2016 to 2017. It was all over the news two weeks ago, and that is significant. It's in pure numbers. It's not uh, in percentages or, you know, based on the size of the city. It's literally the most people came to San Antonio over any other city of any size in the nation from 2016 to 2017. Our population is expected to grow by a million people by 2040. You've all heard this too. Uh, just to clarify, because it's a common misconception, half of that is, is naturally occurring growth. In other words, it's just citizens of San Antonio reproducing. Uh, the other half is actually people moving in from, from, from other places. Um, we can already feel the impact. There's a whole flock of construction cranes over downtown. Uh, we see you know, photographs on Facebook feeds of, 
of the new ones that seem to pop up every day. And we're seeing traffic congestion that's markedly worse than, than we've been accustomed to in recent years. Uh, commutes are extending as new neighborhoods are sprawling further out and tax appraisals are going up throughout San Antonio as the housing market tightens. Uh, we're in a position right now to decide what the San Antonio of 2040 is going to look like. Our comprehensive plan has given us a roadmap, but it's only good if we follow it. So my question to the panel is, what does San Antonio 2040 look like to you and how do we get there? What 20th century development patterns do we need to let fall by the wayside? Which patterns of development should we embrace to retain our cultural character while addressing our environmental issues, ensuring healthy communities with access to opportunity for all? And I'm going to turn this one over to Peter. Thank you very much. Well, uh, appreciate y'all being here. Thanks. That might help. Um, so part of the work that I've done I spent about 15 years creating a, a Greenfield Master Plan New Urban Community in Kyle, Texas, uh, which is about 17 miles south of Austin. Um, it's 200 and, well, what is it, 2,200 total acres. And uh, over the 15 years I was there, we built homes from $90,000 to $300,000, multifamily. Uh, we had an elementary school in the heart of the neighborhood that everyone could walk to, and Alamo Community College, or, excuse me, Austin Community College uh, had a campus there. And what we were trying to do in that space was um, undo some of the problematic aspects of greenfield suburban development, which is that typically uh, development patterns that are the most common in auto-centric United States put you in a car, separate uses. This is talking about zoning. And so you can't have houses next to buildings that have shops or businesses, and you can't have schools too close to houses um, because you need a big road to get the kids from the uh, school to the to the house and back and forth. Um, basically, every daily trip involves you getting in a car. The other thing that happens with most conventional suburban development is you're chewing up lots and lots of land. So at an average density of four units per acre, um, which is a pretty standard suburban density, to accommodate the half million new homes that we'll need, that would be 125,000 acres, which is kind of hard to contemplate, but just it's too much like we can't do that so that's not an option so if the 2040 view means that's not an option then it means doing something else so another thing that I spent a lot of time looking at is you know this market demand is more than just numbers so the absolute numbers of 66 people showing up every day um, that translates into many different things there's this long tail of requirement that goes with new development so that means building all those services building all the roads building all the infrastructure and again, if we continue to push that farther and farther out, um, we're going to, one, chew up a lot of dirt, two, require a lot of extraneous dollars to be spent to accommodate all those new houses, and three, everyone's gonna have to sit in their car for a long time. Because one of the other things about suburban development patterns is they're not dense enough to really make uh, transit meaningful. And they're not dense enough to make walkable urbanism meaningful. And every other trend that we see says that uh, market demand for compact walkable neighborhoods is the thing that's going up to the roof. And as people are aging and are not able to drive, or and as kids coming up, my daughter here, maybe the last generation of Americans who is really excited about getting a driver's license at 16, um, after that, people who are wanting to get in cars every day is, is declining. And so we have to develop and, and build places that do not require that. The other thing from a cost standpoint, everyone is concerned about the growing costs of new development and new housing. Well, if you have to build that long tail of stuff, um, that gets rolled up in the price of houses. So not only are we building bigger, we're building them in a more expensive way. And a way to combat that is to build in places that already have a lot of this infrastructure. So I understand this is one of the big challenges with keeping the character of neighborhoods, which is allowing density in these neighborhoods, um, but it is fundamentally the only way that San Antonio can be a vibrant, sustainable city in 2040, adding a million new people. Uh, the market demand is there. That's what people want. They want walkable urbanism. Walkable urbanism means putting more people in existing neighborhoods, finding a way to do that that's contextual, uh, not disruptive, but uh, we're going to have to relax policies that have strict single-family zoning requirements in, in tier one neighborhoods. I'll just come out and get that out at the beginning of my 
uh, statement here, and we have to find a way to build a variety of housing types because the conventional family is not so conventional anymore. We have more and more no-child households, more and more single-person households, um, and they don't need a 2,200 square foot single family home on a quarter acre, and nor do they want it. Um, I don't know how I'm doing on time here. I can you got segue a few into, more seconds, yeah. Um, segue into the next point, but really, uh, so the the San Antonio that I want for tomorrow is a place that gives people more housing choice, that gives people the opportunity to stay in the neighborhoods that they've lived in, that gives people the opportunity to get into the neighborhoods that they want to get into. And again, this housing choice issue is very, very important, but we're going to need transit. We're going to need walkable cores. And we have wonderful bones in the city. I mean, it's one of the great things about San Antonio and the beautiful fabric of historic neighborhoods that we have um, is that is exactly the kind of place people want to be. And we don't have to invent it from scratch in shirts. We have it right here. We just have to make it so that those great places can accommodate more people. Thanks, Peter. So, um, Ashley, to kind of follow up on that, Peter's brought up some great points about um, re redeveloping our, our inner city, other parts of our city. Is that really the whole story? Can you, can you, you know, San Antonio, we all know, is like a big piece of popcorn. We're one of the least dense cities in the nation. Is it really a matter of just building in our, our core? Or are we looking at suburban retrofit? Um, how, how do you see these issues in the context of affordable housing, public transportation systems, and equity and access to opportunity? Well, um, can you all hear me? Um, thanks, Jim. Um, well, I think the comprehensive master plan is actually a very good start. Um, we have the opportunity here in San Antonio to learn from some of the mistakes that other cities, like Houston, for example, have made over time. And, um, you know, the focus on developing those regional centers in particular, um, I think it's a very good strategy. Um, you know, obviously that works much better to have a robust uh, transit system. Uh, and one of the things that I like about the comprehensive master plan also is that it looks at the overall problem of, of housing and transit and putting jobs near the people who need them um, as an overall system and not just looking at these problems individually. Um, I would agree with um, uh, some of the things that Peter was talking about and um, trying to reduce the amount of sprawl that we are creating. I think we are closing in on 500 square miles for uh, within the city limits. Um, and we really, we have spread out so much, um, we need to start filling in some of those holes. Um, we probably don't need to build that many more roads at this point. Um, we can barely afford to take care of the ones that we have already built. Um, so, you know, what does the future development patterns look like? I would say, you know, we all love those old neighborhoods. We love those, those historic places in San Antonio. Those are the things that a lot of people think that makes this city uh, special. Um, and if you look at the development patterns in those places, they have grids. You know, they have highly connected neighborhoods um, and, you know, easy access to all the things that we like to have in our neighborhood, and they're um, generally closer to downtown. Um, hopefully, if we can encourage development in those regional centers, um, it will start to give people more options and alleviate some of the pressure that we're seeing on the uh, downtown uh, neighborhoods. Um, and uh, I'm sure we'll talk more about all of that. So. Great, thank you. Well, uh, do any of our other panelists have anything to add to that? John? Yeah, I I'll say a couple words on it. So um, yeah, my background is really in the, obviously in the finance side of it from my little bio there, I guess. So uh, I look at really what makes the project successful from an economic standpoint. Can we, what's it take to put a, a unit on the ground? What does it take to make a project work? Because at the end of the day, if it economically doesn't make sense, it won't get done. And so at least at you know, the projects I've been involved in. So 
what that when I look at what um, where we've tried to focus on the urban development and I compare that to greenfield development you know builders who build out in Schertz or Bernie or Cibolo why why do they do that why don't they just come down where they can sell you know houses at 260 70 dollars a square foot you know like uh, like they're doing next to the pro right now um, because it's really hard and it's really expensive and it's really easy to go out into the middle of a field and put the roads in put the water sewer in the permitting process is straightforward and easy we've we've incentivized that either by by default or by you know unintended uh, means through the city to make it easy to do that make it cost effective to do that um, there's also I think a market demand right if you can go buy a 3,000 square foot house for two hundred seventy thousand dollars out there there's a lot of people that that is very appealing towards and and they will maybe sacrifice sitting in their car 45 minutes a day each way um, but that's a decision they have to make because buying a house in the urban core right now less than two hundred fifty thousand dollars that is you know has the same level of amenities that you're gonna find out there is very challenging it's very challenging if you look on as I'm sure you know many of you are interested in housing pull up realtor.com and try to find a you know a new house or a recently renovated house at that price point in the urban core it's it's thin right it's very hard to do that so how it's how do we make that so that we can promote and incentivize that type of growth that we all say we need because to Peter's point the future has to has to be urban right it has to be the, the 13 nodes in the comprehensive plan it has to be the urban core because the alternative is unsustainable you know we will not succeed as a city without it um, but unfortunately we can't tell people where they're gonna live and buy a house we have to produce a product that they want to buy and encourage them to do that by letting that market force to some degree help make that a choice that they can make and so right now you know Peter can you know Peter or any developer that that deals in this urban market can tell you it is it is hard to get products on the ground um, at an affordable price point and as a result you know it, I think it exacerbates all the problems that I'm sure we'll talk about gentrification um, you know everything that comes along with that to some degree as a result of of the difficulty of developing downtown um, so well, if I want to thanks John sure. Liz you holding your mic like you want to say something I do um, thanks Peter thanks Ashley I didn't know Ashley was an architect I should know these things and uh, <laughs> thanks John all right quick to the point um, on the infill development and yes I do agree with the 2040 plan and uh, you know in more than one arena because as I as I get older and realize when I was in the suburbs you can't do anything without a car you can't so those regional centers start to really make sense and start to really create employment centers educational hubs uh, health and medicine whereas I don't have to worry about is that amber alert me uh, <laughs> <laughs> so to that end, now let's talk about this infill development and the unintended consequences because I've given a lot of thought to this and I've known both John, not John is quite as long, but I do know Charlie and uh, Peter French for almost three years now. And I understand intimately what infill development is because I didn't then and I had to look it up because everybody smacked me with, Liz, it's infill development. And I'm like, okay. There's a lot over there. The biggest challenge and the unintended consequences, in my opinion, is we need a better mix. We need a better balance because four homes on what was previously a single family lot, the unintended consequences of that to make your price point work are going to drive somebody out of their home in taxes. Period. The end. They've held on to that. 30, 40 years. So I'm not against the development. I think we need a better plan to entice you to go half of that. So we're getting one, we still have 170 vacant lots in Dignity Hill. And you're the biggest developer we got there. Ask him how many units he's got. That's all I got to. Thanks, Liz. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, no, no problem. This is great. This is what we want to hear. Uh, my name is Rose Hill, and I am president of Government Hill uh, Neighbor Association. I'm sure many has known that we've had a 
a lot of controversy in our neighborhood about development. But my, one thing that um, I guess being as president is one of the hardest things for us is to understand is um, how do you stop growth? How do you stop growth coming into a neighborhood? Uh, when the Pearl took off, we took off, and we didn't even know how fast we were going to go. Right now, we're, we're, we're in the sense of uh, people want to move into our neighborhood. Uh, we have nowhere for them to live at. Uh, we've got a lot of vacant lots. Uh, people in our neighborhood are, um, you know, got a little greedy and decided to sell, instead of selling the lots for 3000 or 25000 years ago, now they're going for 150000 You can't afford, an uh, average couple cannot afford that. So my question is that, how do you stop growth? Great, thank you very much. Um, I, this, this is an incredibly interesting question, and it actually feeds into our third major question, which is, how do we, we can't stop growth, how do we, how do we ameliorate it, right? How do, we, how do we mitigate its effects? And I think that's what the whole panel's gonna attempt to discuss in the third question. Thank you. Okay, here we go. With continuing infill development in San Antonio, how do you plan to include the voices and opinions of people who live in the neighborhoods under development, specifically Dignity Hill? Oh, Is that your question? <laughs> Liz, did you write that question? Liz! <laughs> Okay, oh. do we have anybody who wants to take that on? Liz's cell phone number is? <laughs> <laughs> I can help with that. Or I, I want to hear what David's got to say. I want somebody that's an outsider to be our mediator. We're going through a, a, a tricky separation right now. Meaningful input from the neighborhood uh, is, is something that's very important. And I think that a lot of problems could be headed off um, if that input is sought from the neighborhood. Um, earlier in the process, Are you gonna do um, three per or and two and per if it's actual process. input, not just conversations about this is what we're going to do, and we're not going to change our mind. We have seven um, we have seven sometimes, oftentimes, um, neighbor, neighborhoods have concerns that are really valid. Um, they know their neighborhoods. They know the people living there. They know um, the area, the situation, the street, the traffic, the the crime, the, the pedestrians, okay. the everything. They know it in and out. Um, in ways that no developer coming in for the first time could possibly know it. And they do have valid concerns. Um, sometimes they have great ideas. They're not all opposed to development. Um, and sometimes they're just looking to have a seat at the table. Um, and, and they don't want to be run over or railroaded. Um, I don't know if that really answers the question. I, I, I'd love to jump in on this too. Is it, so from the development side, um, a couple things. One. Uh, and I believe and practice engagement with communities, you know, before you get steamrolling on your projects. I would tell you the challenge is how inclusive, how to know how inclusive you have to be, um, how to know who you were supposed to be dealing with within a neighborhood, Rose, right? I mean, Rose is the president of the Government Hill Neighborhood Association. There are other people who will tell you they are the president. We know Rose is the president, but there are multiple neighborhoods in San Antonio that have multiple groups who say, no, we're the one. You got to talk to us. Don't talk to them, in fact. In fact, if you talk to them, then we're not going to work with you. That's really hard. That's just a landmine set up that discourages developers who might otherwise engage the community because, and I mean, Liz, tell me about what's happening in, in Dignity. I mean, how's that, how's that working out? So Whoa. this, well, this <laughs> first is, of all, you know I'm going to defend my peeps. Of course you are. <laughs> I'm saying this is really tough. You know, it's, it's how many of these meetings are there? And as the developer, the other thing is happening is you bought a piece of property, you're paying interest on it, you're hiring architects, you come up with a concept plan. I know the idea is meet with the neighborhood first, then come up with a concept. But every one of these steps is time, and every one of those steps is dollars. Right. And the question, like, why is housing so expensive? Well, I mean, this Ogden Hughes deal in Southtown the other day, they spent a couple of weeks, ten, fifteen thousand dollars $15,000, designed their plan, reduced the total number of units, came back. That's just money that flies out of the pocket and of, of their pocket and produces less housing at the end of the day. So it would be awesome from the development standpoint. And Cosm and I have had this conversation, like, what if neighborhoods got together and said, we want X, Y, Z, here are 10 lots that... We've already gotten together and decided that we want to see something happen on and reverse this deal because it's really tough going the other way. It's really tough to know who to talk to. It's 
really tough to know how much conversation you have to have. Okay. So, first of all, Peter, I can't speak for anybody else or any other neighborhood, although every now and again I armchair quarterback. But the reality of the situation is if you know, if you know that that neighborhood is going through challenges, my suggestion to you, <laughs> go neutral. Send out a community forum where you're not being pitted one against the other and you're not perceived as the bad guy because that is a problem and I understand that. And I've always been cognizant of your time being money because um, I wouldn't want anybody to do that to me. Now, to give the Dignity Hill Neighborhood Association, let's get that pink elephant out of the room right now. He's brand new. They are brand new. They need some time. Okay, I'm not mad that they wanted to change the arc. Three and a half years? I'd be a little nervous if I moved into a new neighborhood and I said, you're representing my interests? How do I know that? Or an older person who says, you're representing my interests? How do I know that? My taxes just went up again. So it's a double-edged sword. So the first thing you really have to do, in my opinion, is... Stop picking on us. Pick on Government Hill. Um, <laughs> is just recognize that we're working through our issues. We've been here a long time. Um, I don't care if they got here yesterday, two years ago, five years ago. I remember the first time I met Chris Mungin. We haven't always sat in the same, on the same seat. Well, it's hard because I'm chubby. But... We haven't always been on the exact same side of an issue. But one thing I can say for sure is, God forbid I needed something or they needed something, he's still my neighbor and we're still civil. Um, we're going to work it out. It's our neighborhood. He has as much right and his wife has as much right as I do about my investment. And that goes right down to the legacy. Um, it, it, it's going to take some time. Liz. You, you just go neutral. I'm having a community forum because I got a new thing going in, Dignity Hill or Government Hill, until you know we're better. I, that's, that's, that's what I was going to do. All right, so what that? back up. Did I say just, that? just a little background. Some of what she's been talking about is some recent upheavals, both in the Dignity Hill well, Neighborhood I'm Association so I had to say that. And, and the Government Hill Neighborhood Association. When she says they go neutral, she's talking about the development team needs to go into a neutral forum, hold a public meeting, and invite everyone in the neighborhood right. to that so public meeting so that, and, and don't go in, and, and I think what you're saying is don't go in and try to play internal neighborhood politics, yeah, right? That, 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 that that's not inclusive, and it's, it's just not a good solution. It's not transparent, and it doesn't build bridges, right? Right. Okay, so we got another question from the audience, and just, just once again, we're drawing these randomly from a hat. Um, when will we get serious, or how, about mass transit if every new infill person drives one car that will create too much traffic? Who'd like to take that one on? Ashley? Well, um, sure. Excuse me. Um, you know, if you look at San Antonio's um, housing plus transportation costs, uh, as far as housing goes, we're not that far off of what um, other folks are paying around the country as, as a percentage of their median income. But if you look at the transportation costs in San Antonio, we are way high. We're spending about 23% of our income on just getting around. It should be probably about 15%. So that's money that you don't have to put to your retirement or to you know, help put your kids through college. And part of the reason is that we're just so spread out now. Um, and you know, it's very hard even just to go to like a one car kind of you know, family. People try that probably. Um, it's just a real challenge unless you live um, you know, very close to where um, you work. Um, 
the problem I know that uh, you know, VIA and just about any other uh, transit organization has when things are so spread out is that there really aren't, I mean, what, what transit does is it just moves a lot of people from point A to point B, right? And when there aren't enough people at either, at either juncture, it's very hard to get the kind of ridership that you want. Another problem um, that we have is that we're asking our transit to do two totally different things that are in opposition to each other. One, we want to have more ridership, right? We want more people to, to use the bus or potentially, you know, uh, trackless trains. Uh, there, I mean, I don't get really too hung up on the precise technology. Um, it's, you know, this transit is a solution to a problem, right? Um, but when we also ask VIA to cover those 500 square miles and, you know, provide service to everybody, well, that's just, you know, spreading the peanut butter that much thinner. So I think that, you know, if we want to just say to via hey you know 90% of your budget is should be going to increasing ridership to you know to those routes and you know if we can develop more around that um, uh, comprehensive master plan I think that'll make their mission a lot easier I know there's two new via board members that well I guess Akeem is new but Brian Brian is fairly new and those are both young Eastsiders that have I think a lot of vested interest in seeing you know, before, uh, just a different way to, to view um, the way things have been done in the past. So I think those are kind of bright points to, to that problem. But I agree. I mean, I think, you know, I've talked with developers up and down Broadway who, you know, it's almost impractical to take a bus from Broadway to get downtown. You miss a bus and it's 30, 40 minutes to the next bus, you know, and that's not a, a real viable method of of getting to where you need to go it's the number nine the number nine yeah <laughs> yeah four lines on broadway yeah. um and i think the convenience of it you know if, if you can increase that that route time or decrease the the or increase the frequency of the route you know but that again takes money via is underfunded via has all the, the headwinds that it has um but yeah can i just toss one other idea out there sure um, by building parking, we are incentivizing driving. And by forcing everyone to build parking, you also make housing more expensive. So it seems paradoxical, but by having no parking requirements and by stopping the construction of a, if I don't know that I have a parking space at the other end, just like what happens with Fiesta and with a lot of other events, Via gets on the thing and says, you know you can't find parking during Fiesta, don't drive. And people go, okay, that's true, I can't. Well. We can make that sort of decision at both ends of the development side from a policy standpoint and on the development side and and actually discourage driving just because it's so inconvenient and that there's pain obviously in that process, but it's a thing. <laughs> Did you have one final? You got your mic up. Oh, yeah. You know, one of the statistics, statistics that I saw was that for every new car, there are eight parking spaces. Right, and if we're adding 66 people per day, and I don't know how many cars that means, but it's a lot. <laughs> Just think about how much asphalt that is. It's an incredible amount of the hill country that we are going to end up paving over. So, yeah. Great. Well, um, thank you for the, the questions from the audience. We're going to take more time. We're going to take a little time at the end of these leader questions, and then we're going to take more time at the end to kind of generally. Uh, talk about kind of questions that come from the audience. So moving on to the the second question. So there's some terms that pop up every day in the national narrative around cities, right? We've got gentrification, we've got nimbyism, we've got disinvestment, we've got equity, we've got econ economic segregation, right? Th these are the big ones. Um, so you put them all together in one sentence and it's a pretty toxic stew. San Antonio uh, moves at a different pace than, than other metropolitan areas around the nation. You know, there's this myth that we're the seventh largest city in the nation. We're more like 26 or 27 when you look at metropolitan statistical area. Um, what we are, in fact, is a giant ball of popcorn, right? We're one of the least dense cities in the nation. So in terms of pure population, we're pretty far down the list. There's just a lot of land. We're sprawled out all over. Um, 
So we're, we've got our own sort of unique pace. We've got our own cultural identity, cultural norms, and we've got our own sort of economic trajectory that we're on. And, and so I guess my question to the panel is, you know, looking at these loaded terms, how do you feel they apply to San Antonio's specific conditions? Like, how do you, how do you um, view them in the context of San Antonio's neighborhoods and, and our own particular history? And I think I'm going to turn to David. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to turn to you first on this one, see what you have to say. Because I haven't spoken yet, maybe. Or... <laughs> I noticed that. Um, so thank you, Jim. Um, so I, I am an architect. I've, I've focused my career on, on architectural projects primarily. Um, and I've never really used these terms with my clients. Okay. Most, most of my practice is, is buildings and design and more design and design. Uh, but I also do uh, work with, with the AI chapter San Antonio as the Urban Affairs uh, Committee Chair. And our mission there is to, to, uh, to help facilitate the public's voice in public design decisions. And so we've been approached by uh, groups like Port San Antonio to, uh, to come and volunteer or facilitate envisioning charrettes, uh, where we develop conceptual design solutions for urban design scale uh, projects. Um, and some neighborhood associations have also come to us. Um, I'm going to get to the terms, but um, the uh, the thing I heard earlier was about if neighborhoods develop vision plans to show design solutions to developers to set, entice them, to guide them, uh, to do things that the neighborhood, the existing neighborhood and neighbors feel is appropriate. Um, that's the vision planning process. And that's what is a big, big missing piece here. We, we need to do more of that. It's, it's an inclusive process. Uh, it's got to be open. It's got to be the neutral forum that, that she was speaking of earlier. Um, and it's got to come first. Um, and I think that those terms are, are, are what, you, what, what you brought as the terms those are the terms that, that get defined in those vision planning sessions by the community. And whether it's toxic stew or whether it's, um, you know, disinvestment or, or whether it's more positive things like a beautiful building that looks like this one that I found in some other city. You know, the, the terms that we, we need to use to talk to each other need to be developed here to some extent. Um, and, and I like the idea of, of the fact that we might have our own pace in San Antonio, that it's not a slow pace. It's not what I thought it might be when I moved here 15 years ago. It's, it's a very engaged, engaging place and community. And, um, but we do have that control over ourselves, I think. And, and if the pace allows us the time to define these terms and to take the steps that we need to, uh, I think that's kind of the key. Finding our unique demographic makeup, uh, letting all of our, our voices here speak. Uh, like I said, I've been here 15 years. I, I feel like I'm just starting to scratch the surface to get to know this place. And everybody doesn't participate in these public forums, uh, but I think it's growing and I think we need to encourage that more and more so yeah. okay thank you david well I'm, I'm gonna scratch that record a little deeper so liz why don't you take a crack at this let's talk about economic colonization right what let's just let's lay it all out on the table what <laughs> tell us tell us about your neighborhood tell us about dignity hill and some of the changes you've seen from the perspective of of people who feel like there's change that's outside of their control from people who feel like they have been disenfranchised, that they don't have a voice. Tell us about uh, people that may feel like they are being priced out of their homes. Tell us about that perspective uh, from the neighborhood level, because you've been there down in the trenches. 
boy, oh boy. Do I have to go to the economic development piece first? Um, <laughs> the gentrification. Boy, I scratched my head with this for a long time since this is part of my second conversation about it because I had to ask others, am I one of those? Am I one of those? I didn't really know because I'm a relative newcomer to Dignity Hill. Many of those legacy families or long-term families have been there 50, 60, 70 years, which would bring up the nimbyism and the irony of the whole thing is if you asked many of them today, when I got there 10 years ago, they didn't care what I did. <laughs> they just were glad somebody that was going to turn lights on was living there. And you're going to open up the windows so we can see them? That's amazing. That's what they cared about 10 years ago. Um, but the legacy, what I find when I'm dealing with older homeowners is the one of the unintended consequences of development. And with the rising cost of taxes and the values of their land, things that have been in their family for generations, when you've got the next person being 30, 35 years old, and they're not sure, as a school teacher, they can keep up with the taxes, then no, all of a sudden, they don't want the newcomers in. But we re it's funny for me, I say we really do, as if I were there 50 or 60 years, but they blessed off on me being here. They, meaning those folks, were glad that I was here. I don't think they don't want the development. I think that it masks something else. We're scared of losing what we've had. We're scared we don't, that you, you are going to run us off. Um, and that's where we get the, the, the bad tag of gentrification. I mean, it's not a picnic over in Dignity Hill. I'm going to tell you that right now. The neighborhood's changing, but I can't get a police to respond to a call any quicker than anybody else in the neighborhood. I don't care how well off you are. I don't care how big your house is, whether you're doing renova renovations or restorations, because that's another problem and another situation that needs to be addressed. So I don't think it's that we, we there isn't room for all of us. 170 vacant lots says there's plenty of room. It just requires a little bit more common conversation of, oh, yeah, I mean, me personally, I react a little bit differently, and I find most of my neighbors are like that, in my block or my sector, because we're more closely connected with things that are really problematic for us there. Um, and the economic development, geez, that is, that's a big one, because at least, you know, I was thinking about this today as I was trying to prep, and you know, you can't really prep. You just have to go for what you know when you walk in the streets. Not that I do that anymore. But anyway, that's, you know, no, 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 Liz. Focus, sorry. All right, but the reality of the situation is at least 30%, 35% of Dignity Hill continues to struggle financially um, to keep lights on to feed the kids in the summer because now they're there for an eight hour day when somebody else was watching them. And I don't think we fully appreciate that unless we're in the middle of, oh, we should save Ella Austin? Oh, what do you mean that Susie next door doesn't have anything to eat and they haven't eaten past breakfast in three weeks? But it happens very real in our neighborhood. Crime is still, a, I mean, crime is still a problem in Dignity Hill. We're not gentrified. We're not, we're not there yet. We can't get a response and a reduction in the crime any more than somebody that's been there 40 or 50 years. So they don't not want us here. They just want to make sure we're not going to get rid of them. And that starts with a, a conversation. That starts with me saying, hey, I got some of that extra. Do you want it? That starts with me saying, because I really love this part, the Mungins are doing a bang-up job on their house. Their house is so, it is getting to be very sexy. 
But how many people walk up and say, hey, Chris, I li- Lauren, I like it. It looks sexy. But, of course, we're all looking at the, uh, at the work that they're doing. But don't get it twisted. They have their challenges coming straight up Nolan, too. It requires a little bit more. Now, the economic development, that takes on another piece. That's transportation. That's access to better paying jobs. The better paying blue collar jobs require about three buses to get to. So when you're when I'm turning around and I'm like looking for a job and I can't put that all together and be gone for two hours in the morning when I gotta take the kids to school, that takes on now I'm relegated to the bottom rung of the low end jobs. And that requires some push, some pull, some negotiation with bringing in industry, even if it's blue collar, that pays a living wage. Because I can't run the 37%, realistically speaking, if I wanted to, I can't run them out quick enough. They're going somewhere. They could, they could be your cousin, your auntie, your brother, or me. They're going to go somewhere. Which is why the mayor's task force on housing is so critical is we're going to need it forever because we've statistically had poorer populations for longer. We're a tourism industry. That's one of our mainstays. It's a bottom rung job. But if I got to get three, and, and you know, I love somebody that says, well, go to the training. Is that after my second job or before my second job? Is that after I make the decision to try and get a $14 an hour job for three buses? It all goes together for me. I understand the regional concept, but if you're cool with a three car a three car garage out in your regional hub, I want more time on my buses. I want more frequency on my buses because it's necessary for some of the population that was already here before I got here. Sorry, you didn't ch- you didn't check me? Did I talk? 20? No, you're doing great. Okay, I'm done. Okay, well, good. Um, uh, Liz, Liz brings up some really great points and, and is hitting on some of the things I hope that would come out in this forum. And the, the very last thing you said is that San Antonio is historically a poor city. That's one of the things that um, we don't have in common with many of the other big metropolitan areas and that we do have historic disinvestment south of 410. That's why you know all of this investment we've seen over the last 10 years downtown has been such a shock to everyone. It's just like, wham, it it, it sort of hit everybody. But we do have the opposite problem, and we still have it, not just in Dignity Hill, but, you know, through vast swaths of the south side and the east side and the, you know, and the west side in particular, where where we really do need community development. We really do need cash injection. We really do need public services and transportation and access to jobs and opportunity. So so how do we how do we find a a balance, you know, maybe I'd, I'll turn it over to one of these developers. Like, you know, what, what can we do that isn't just everybody pile onto the hot neighborhood to sort of spread some of this out and out and share the wealth? I'll jump right into this one. Um, I think, you know, the, the sort of confession or the reality that people are scared of change and scared of losing what they have has to be kind of acknowledged anytime you're going into a, a transitional neighborhood to, to do something new. Um, The flip side of that is the neighborhoods, and they grapple with this, but it's maybe not the way they articulate it, and that is this cost of blight, which is kind of what we're talking about. That the vacant lots in the infill, there's an opportunity cost to them being vacant. It's it's not just that they're collecting very little tax revenue, it's that they're encouraging bad things to happen on them. You know, derelict homes don't just not produce tax revenue and not have people living in them. They are magnets for crime and for problems. And this this is the flip side. Now, the other part of that is there has to be a policy solution for longtime homeowners who are getting priced out. Right. I'll, I'll push back against one of the things that Liz said, and that is that the development is the cause of the tax increases. I didn't say I, that 100%. Did I not 100%. Say it like that? Uh, but I think, <laughs> you know, I... We need a bigger pie. So like step one is, you know, sprawl costs more than infill. Uh, It costs everybody more to run a 90 inch sewer line out to Highway 90 than it does to replace a sidewalk down Nolan Street. Um, And so 
you know, this vacant lot issue is problematic. And the, you know, so a policy standpoint, a policy deal to keep people in their homes, we need that. Absolutely. I would love to see, you know, the power of the tier one neighborhood coalition coming together to demand their share of the incremental taxes that are created by new development, not fighting that development. Because it's not the new development that's making your taxes go up. It's the fact that there's a bunch of shit that needs to be fixed that we don't have the money for. It's the historic disinvestment, not the new development that is causing the increase in the taxes. And so that's where these interests that don't seem aligned now have to align. Um, I was trying to think about, you know, another way to quantify that is, and that is quality of life is what people want. Quality of life is what people are afraid of losing. Um, and so how can we use the economic development power of new development and give neighborhoods an opportunity to capture some of that so they can get parks, get sidewalks, get the quality of life that they're supposed to have that made the place great at the beginning. Peter, thanks. I think I want to challenge you on that, that statement of yours that, that, that new development and our property tax valuation system isn't causing this sort of uh, collateral effect. Uh, John, maybe you want to yeah, I, talk I would, about property tax valuation. I would, I guess, disagree with you a little bit on there. I, I do think that there is, you know, when, when someone comes in and puts a new house on the block and someone is willing to pay you know, above what has been paid before for that house, it helps, it sets that bar higher for everything else in the block. Even if your house is a teardown or it's a vacant lot, right, it just, it creates a little bit of energy. But I'd say the, the flip side to that is, you know, that's, that is in itself not the problem, right? The problem is these vulnerable populations that are not able to manage that, right? You want, I mean, the, the amount of, well, I guess, if, I, if you look at Dignity or, or any of these neighborhoods, in the in the urban core that have seen this this growth, I would argue that they are better off today than they were five years ago. Would that be fair, Liz? Which part? Well, say say dignity, historic Why? dignity. In, well, in general, what, what what would you say is better today in those neighborhoods? What's worse off today? That's crime. a great that's a great question. Is crime is crime less than it was five years no. ago? No, it's not less. No, as a matter of fact, Violent when I crime. took my eye off of it because I came from a suburban environment. When I took my eye off of it. Next thing I know, it's like, it's like roaches. They're back. Um, I didn't know that. Oh, you got to have the mic so they can hear Oh, I'm sorry. Rec record it. All right. I didn't but know. But we can all hear you. Don't worry. Yeah, that's what I thought. <laughs> well, I guess, um, I guess my... Not, okay, so... Not to cut you off, Liz, but, but what I, I think what that tax base, as it grows, it funds, it, it, while it... For the new people that move in that that agreed to pay that rate, uh, paid three hundred fifty thousand dollars for that house, and and said, "I know what my taxes are going to be. I'm going to pay it." Those taxes fund the school system. They fund the hospital district. They fund the improvement district. That's the money that then comes in to help, kind of, I think, get a, a seat at the table in a lot of these, dis, you know, discussions when it comes to allocating improvements. Because now we are as a as a block, we have we have that momentum growing, and and what we've got to figure out is, to in my view not fight the market force in some ways, but protect those populations that cannot manage it. And I think that's where, if I had to pick a role for government, I think that's where I think the, the, the city, the county has to, and you know, Jim's point on the, on the task force, right. those, are the, those are the areas that need the solutions, right? You're not gonna stop people from wanting to live in Government Hill or Dignity Hill or Tobin Hill. You, you just, they wanna be there, right? And, right. and that's good. You know, we, there's there's good things about that, but what we we have to figure out a way to manage that other side of it. And I don't think that, you know, I don't think that it is just inherently slow down or reduce density or somehow push back on the development because the taxes are high. How do you use that to offset the the issue that we're seeing with with displacement and gentrification? Well, for that part, I could agree with that because yes. development and the positive aspects of gentrification are good okay um i mean really but the reality of the situation is in dignity hill is we don't come together as a group a collective group yeah. and say forget about that over there let's go ahead and address this issue and how we as neighbors because we really Dignity Hill has a lot of clout, except with our district councilman. Oh, did I say that? No. Um, but the point that I'm trying to make is How are we, doing on time we, 
We're doing? a little too fractured for that. We have to come together and really agree on a roadmap and then uh, execute that roadmap. Now, I will still not go, Peter, and I love you because you only did one little house in, um, <laughs> in, in Dignity Hill. Yeah. But the reality of the situation is if I had to pick one thing today where I was turning around and looking at closely at development and unintended consequences, I would be, I would be, not because I care about the density, I would be completely opposed to slicing up one single family lot into five, three two-story bedrooms. Uh, three two-story bedrooms, you know what I mean. All right, why? Because the minute the first one sold, that set the standard for what the prevailing price is going for. And yes, it did set the standard for our taxes. So, but, so but that's but that's the market, right? I mean, people would willing you to pay You know what? That. I don't want to hear about the market, John. When we're talking about somebody thinking they won't be in their home 100%. next year this time, and I'm not mad at you. No, I, and okay? I agree. Uh, I'm just saying, for a minute, we have absolutely got to agree that nobody should be forced out of a roof over their head, I, and I, whether they've been here three minutes. Or three hundred years, uh, and I, and I think, and that is what I tried to tried to. If I had better, give, give him a chance, Liz. Give if, him a chance. Well, yeah. no, that's, and, that, and I agree with you, Liz. And Sorry. but to say that, and I'm not mad at but John. But to say that that you know that, that a house isn't worth what someone's willing to pay for it is, for for me, it's hard to for me to get my mind around that at the end of the day. Oh, I know, because you're in it for different reasons. Than that's I not am. true. I mean, I own a house. You own a house. If we were to sell our house and you want to sell it for the most you could sell it for. No one's going to say, well, you know, Liz, you, you sold it for more than, than you should have, right? No. They're going to say sell it for as much as you can, and, and that doesn't make you greedy, Baby, right? let's stay on topic. The topic is the 37% that struggle, whether they're renters, owners, Absolutely. and out of those 37%, a good percentage of them are homeowners, okay? So I want you to make a profit. If we got along better. Number one, number two, I agree. The city should bear some responsibility, but that's step number three is how do we get better? Make it better incentive package. Because see, the reason I stick around with you and Charlie, other than the fact that you guys won't go away, is I hope someday that there'll be a saturation <laughs> point where I can say, Can we do ten houses that are under two nineteen now? Please. Just ten. Pick any, anywhere in the square mile of the 170 vacant lots so that somebody that does get that living wage and then gets a better opportunity at training and education because they only have to work one job can move into that because it's a starter home now. Your homes are not starter homes on the market. They are in suburbs, but not where we're at. And you know that. But okay, anyway. Liz. Anise has been waiting patiently to, to talk. I, you should just shut me up. <laughs> no, you're you're um, you're right on the mark. I think um, in a lot of ways. Sorry. I want to say uh, two years ago, I got my property tax valuation, and um, surprise, it went up. Um, and yeah. nobody's shocked by that. Um, but what was interesting is. Um, our improvement did not go up. Our land value went up. In fact, our land value doubled. Um, what's happening in a lot of our core neighborhoods closest to downtown is they, um, they're being sold to developers who are then dividing the lot up and doing infill. And so a lot that previously held one home is now holding four homes or three homes or five homes. Um, and that is not lost on our appraisal district. So they understand that the value of our land is more than the value of our house. Right. And that means even if you're not a legacy homeowner, even if you haven't been in your home for 50 or 60 years or inherited your house, um, you're watching your property taxes go up so fast that you're not sure you can stay in your neighborhood. And if you are um, a landlord, you have to raise the rent on your tenants' homes. Um, and it's going to displace people. It's going to displace people because they're either going to feel pressure to sell their house because they can't afford their property taxes, or they're going to 
raise their rent and displace their renters. Um, when, um, when people inherit their homes, they, um, in my neighborhood, I, ha I have a lot of neighbors that have been in their homes for 50 or 60 years. They've lived there since they were 10 years old. Um, they inherited them from their families. Um, a lot of them have caps, but um, they see the property taxes going up. There's a lot of other pressures. Sometimes the neighborhood is changing, and they're not happy. And then they become vulnerable in another way. They can't just cash in, right? A lot of people want to say, well, gentrification is not bad. These people have houses that are so valuable now. They can just sell it, and they can make a ton of money, and they can, they can make so much money because they don't even have a mortgage. Or maybe they do have a mortgage. Um, but that's not always what happens. A lot of times what happens is um, there are predatory investors out there that will come and make cash offers on these houses. And a lot of times these people don't know better. And they think it sounds good. They're getting offers for what their tax valuation says. And they think that is what their house is worth. And we know that the market is different than what our property tax valuations say. Um, so. They then sell their house, they think they made a lot of money, but really they go and they take this money and they don't have anywhere else to go. They don't have another neighborhood to move into because all of the neighborhoods are gentrifying. They can't just move from Tobin Hill to Dignity. It's the same story over there. So it's, it, it is an effect. Um, when, when larger developments come in and they buy one lot and subdivide it and build three houses or four houses, it has an effect on our property taxes. And it's not just because, oh, that's a nice house and my house isn't so nice. It's because our land is now worth more. Thank you, Anissa. Okay, so this has been, this has been a, a great conversation. Um, and, I, and I really did want it to kind of get everything out onto the table so that we're having an honest conversation as we move into the next question, which is, you know, what can we do to come together to try to find solutions? But first, we're going to take a couple of questions from the audience. Remember, these are at random. This is a two-part question slash comment. I'll read the comment first. This panel and moderator demonstrate the problem inherent in development and colonization. Why are there no people of color present today? Um, and I think that's a very good question. And I'm, you know, I'd have to ask the, the organizers of this uh, forum, I think in part because a lot of the development entities are not people of color. Um, you know, some of the recent folks who've moved into neighborhoods around downtown are not people of color. I'm not people of color, but I grew up on the South Side and went to Bonham Elementary in the 70s and my name was Weddle. So I know that didn't count, but um, I think that's a very good question and I think we should take note of that point. So the question, here's another good one. So do any of the development practitioners utilize equity plans like the racial equity impact assessment tool to ensure equity? I mean, are we, is it just the market that's, that's, yeah. that's kind of driving us or are we looking at other factors? And if we're not, should we be and what kind of tools might we need to be able to do that? Um, that's last little bit's my addendum. I'll, I'll, so we've got a, a, we, Rising Barn, have a small project on the east side on Porter Street. It's five units. Um, now this, so part of this is going to be controversial because we took a single lot, although it's 80 feet by 150 feet, that used to be three lots, and we've turned it into one lot. We're putting five homes on it. Uh, the homes will range in price from 150000 down to 70000 And we've gone and found a nonprofit partner who's going to own the land, They'll give a 99-year land lease to the people who buy it. We're working with the Denver Heights Community Association to identify existing residents of the neighborhood to move into that. Um, and the, I mean, the short answer is we're a for-profit company, but we created ourselves as a, as a public benefit corporation. So we decided that the mission of affordable housing was important and that not making money, the, the most money we could make every time we went out and did a development was the thing that we wanted to do. That was just a choice that we made. Um, and I will tell you, as a guy in the development business, that there are not enough people making that choice. Um, and so how do we get there? Uh, you know, make it easier. Um, that comes from incentives. That comes from the neighborhood. And the sort of ironic thing about this deal is the zoning staff recommended against our zoning case. 
Um, wow. Yeah. Uh, we got it passed anyway, but um, you know, even doing the right thing um, for what seems like just the right reason can be very challenging. And so, uh, that's a trick. Um, now, you know, what's the other part of this? Well, I'll tell you the other part of this, and that comes back to incentivizing good outcomes. The public sector can't fix the affordable housing problem that we're in. I'm just period paragraph. So we have to find a way to engage more private sector folks in this in this pursuit, however, however tool, whatever tool we use to do that. By the way, sorry, that little house um, will be affordable to someone making 30% of area median income with no subsidy of any kind. So that's cool. Thanks, Peter. But see, that's part of the push and pull. And but that's not good news. You know, Okay. Well, uh, and I don't want to use all of our little friends. One is the online guy. The other one is struggling to stay online and print a paper. It's not good news that there's push and pull and that there's a conversation that takes place that can provide a compromise. I'd be willing. I, it's not the lot. I would be willing, and it's not Liz. Liz doesn't own Dignity Hill. She's not the queen. Maybe. Um, but the point is, most of us would be willing to give a little push and pull and not set on, oh, one, one single family home on, on a lot if there was something appealing in there. You know, and John, I, I'm going to tell, tell you I really, really do like and appreciate John Cooley and Charlie from Terramark, but I'm going to beat you right now. You have a little community, <laughs> 24 units at Urban and Olive. I don't care what they look like because 24 units sold, correct? Or you're pretty, you're pre pretty close, okay? What bothers me is that you have a community within a community and there isn't one thing not one dollar changes from one of those units to the other. You didn't, you, you, you plopped down 24 units because that's what you needed to do to make your price point. But near one of those units is below the market that you say is prevailing. We could, a couple of them, a couple of them should have been a little... Could have been a little That's lower. a good question, Liz. So, John, is it possible in the context of a 22-unit infill project to say, yeah, we know the sweet spot in the market is, you know, $210,000 or whatever it is, and we know we're going to sell these like gangbusters if, if we price them all at that. Could you make a few of the units a little bigger and sell them for $370,000 and offset the cost of a couple of units that get down into the you know, $120,000, $130,000 range. I mean, is that kind of, you know, that kind of thinking, is that, do you guys ever con kind of yeah, consider and, that? You know, I look at everything you do when you start a project like that, which if I'd have known that we were going to be able to do exactly what we did, then that changes a lot of the dynamic. But you don't know that when you start. You don't know how long it's going to take. You don't know what you're going to actually be able to get out of it. And the you know the project Going forward let's work on that and i agree and you know but i think here's here's one of the things you know there's a risk associated and it's not a, a griper of a poor me but you know developing is taking risk right it's going out there and and putting money out there to to get an outcome right and there's risk that that is going to be successful there was no guarantee that urban olive was going to be successful that the price points were going to be there a lot of times these projects there are no there's not comps, you know, there's not new houses being built in a lot of these areas. And so there's a certain amount of risk out there. So you're managing that. So I do think, I think there's a couple things that could help promote that. And I think that's one of the, the biggest things we can do is, as we come together on this is how do we promote projects like that? One of the things that, that I am passionate about is I think there should be more smaller scale developers that can come in and do projects and be creative. And because of the is challenge... A historic district? Not, not specific to okay, a historic I'm district. No, I, I mean, and you, I think you know, when, you know, everyone seems to know when you get a historic district, the rules are different, right? But it, the barriers to entry to new development from a developer standpoint are pretty high. Um, it's, it's tough, you know, to, to get through the city, to get through the, the, the management of that project. Well, you're and you're giving it's, board bad information. First of all, you're told by your planner or your, your case manager 
that, yeah, this meets all the guidelines. Sure. And then all of a sudden, yeah. if you're new to a project, you don't need to go talk you're to like, Hills. we didn't even you're gonna be see good. this coming. Right. And so I think, I think one thing we can do as a neighborhood is help, help foster that. You've got 170 lots. Let's find a way to engage small-scale developers to come in and say, you know, I think Peter brought this point up, let's set up some, some density and some site plans that say, if you do something like this, we will support it. We will approve it. We will help guide you through the process. I'm on board, and I can tell you probably there's like five, so, five or ten people in Dignity Hill or the surrounding communities that would say, I'd love to participate in that. And I, I so I think, perfect. guys, I actually think this is a perfect segue into our, our kind of final question. And, and I think this is really, you know, kind of more about solutions, right? So the following, and I'm going to read this verbatim. The following is a, a line I wrote for a Rivard Report article last year. And this is direct quote, it's getting ugly out there. Every week there are neighbors pit fighting with each other and infill developers at the Historic and Design Review Commission, the Zoning Commission and City Council. The developers are frustrated, the neighbors are fearful and uncertain, and regulatory folks and designers are exasperated. This is not healthy and it's wearing us all out. So I wonder how many hours combined all of the development entities and all of the neighborhood interests have devoted going to these meetings and everyone gnashing their teeth and getting frustrated and projects like like the Hay Street Bridge project, like the West Craig project, like, you know, like the one in your neighborhood on uh, uh, Norwood Court. Mistletoe. Uh, mistletoe. But then there's also the, the sort of Norwood Court project, right? Um, is there, is there a solution to this? I mean, is there a way that we can not have these titanic battles in public? Is there something we can do as a community, have a community conversation of, of some kind ahead of time to build some predictability into this system? Um, and, you know, because you two have, have gone toe-to-toe -to -toe on a couple of projects and you've gotten really into the weeds on some potential solutions, I'm going to I'm going to start with you guys and I'm going to start with Anissa on this one. It's it was interesting your last comment about um compromising and listening to the neighborhoods and saying figuring out what they're willing to give and what they will support. Um and I think that is something that goes a really long way. Um I know early in our process, uh perhaps not early enough, but as soon as the neighborhood became aware of it, we reached out and tried to have conversation and have compromise. And um, I think if we could have reached something, it probably would have saved a lot of time. Um, unfortunately, it didn't go that way. But um, Let's talk about moving forward. Yeah, we're Move, moving, moving forward. Moving forward, moving on. But, but, <laughs> but what's important there is, is that conversation. Um, I think that there does need to be that meaningful input. Um, the community meetings, where everyone comes and says, you know, gets on board with what's going on and not just being told what's happening. Um, I do understand that the developer is the one taking the risk, but um, they also should be doing their homework ahead of time. And, and that falls on them. That's their responsibility. If they know that there's a strong neighborhood there, they, they need to be aware of that before they make that purchase. And um, that's, that's not the responsibility of the neighborhood. Um, I think that impact studies need to be done. Um, we need to know uh, what is this development going to do to this neighborhood? What is the traffic going to be like? What um, are the environmental impacts going to be? And what are the tax impacts going to be? What is, what is this going to do to this neighborhood? Um, it's, I, I know that developers tend to be kind of thinking of their bottom line and how are they going to make their sales and make their money. But again, that's not the neighborhood's responsibility. Um, we're, we're trying to figure out how to protect our own investments. You know, you have 10 houses to sell, we have one house. Um, I think that density should, should be allowed, um, but it needs to be in context. It needs to be sensitive to the neighborhood that it's in. Um, you know, setbacks should be paid attention to. The form of the building should be um, paid attention to. Things sticking out like a sore thumb really disrupts a neighborhood. Um, we all chose the places we live because we like something about it, right? We like how it looked or we like how it feel. We like the people who live there. We like 
the way the porches are. We let whatever it is, we all have a reason. Um, there's a culture to each and every one of our streets, right? It might not even be the same culture across one neighborhood. Right. Um, it may be this street has this culture and the next street has a totally different culture. And when new development comes in, that disrupts that. And it doesn't necessarily have to. This can be a more nuanced conversation. It doesn't have to be, oh, they're gentrifiers and they're NIMBYs. Um, it, we'll it can be we'll close it up after they some, something where and people can we'll meet in the middle and have an actual dialogue. Um, I, I think a big part of that, though, is giving the community a voice and, and not just in name, not just saying, well, we had six community meetings or four community meetings or two community meetings where we're being told what's going to happen to us. Um, that's, that's not giving anyone a voice. Um, and, and I think that that is going to give a lot more room for developments where the neighborhoods are on board. Um, and one, one piece with that, which I'm, I'm running out of time, but um, I think that we need a more educated um, zoning commission. And um, I, I know a lot of you have been in zoning hearings where I've, I've heard commissioners say, what's RM4 mean again? What's R6? And, and when the citizens... <laughs> when, when the citizens know more than the people on the commission, that causes problems. And so um, if everyone's going to get on the same page, we need to have um, everyone on the same page. Absolutely, fair fair points. Um, you know, I think to to kind of continue on that, I think the the mutual respect that even though we disagreed on what what the project would look for at the end, what it would come out to be, um, I hope that that we at least maintained a level of discourse and, and and respect for each other. And I mean, I have told anyone who will listen the passion that you showed for that street and the ability that you were able to organize and bring things together. You know that that there wasn't a formal neighborhood group for that street, right? You basically bootstrapped it together, um, and part of that is to to Peter's earlier point. You know, when before we bought the property, we reached out to the listed community association and ran the project by them. They said, "Yeah, sure, sounds good," right? And so, from from a from a developer standpoint, having having a set of rule books, you know, a set of frameworks that you can operate under helps mitigate that. It's it's not, and I don't want to say it's like risk where you know it's it's a, a numbers thing. It's we don't want to have a fight every single time we do anything, right? And so how do we get to the point where we can all kind of say these are the kind of things that we will allow in these areas, right? Because if well, because if you look at you say well maybe that's what zoning is, right? Well, those lots were zoned to be able to do what we did, right? We didn't have to get the zoning change. We didn't do it. So you you say well you know people will say often. Well, my zoning allows me to, you know, it's MF33, I can build four stories at Norwood Court and, you know, tower of my neighbors. You, you can, you know, I mean, so how do we, how do we come together where the, the rule book is more defined so that we don't get to this point where we're, you know, we're both so far engaged in this process that it's really hard to turn that ship around. You know, everyone's made investment, everyone's now upset, and it's like, that's where it becomes toxic. And, you know, back to my earlier point on the smaller scale developers, I think neighborhoods and potentially even the city putting together a more robust developer guideline for your part of town where you have a, someone comes in and you know, they buy a house and they want to say, I want to do something here. They, they can turn to some resource or some office that says, well, here's kind of the framework about it, right? Here's what we, we've all said. These are the kind of houses we like. These are the things that we find acceptable. And there's going to have to be give and take on that, right? You know, a compromise is new. Nobody gets everything they want. So there may be a density that, you know, we give up. But in exchange, we, you know, as a neighborhood, we are now able to, you know, have a more robust say throughout the process. And, and I think you'll find, I would, I would as a developer, you know, relish in something like that that says, here's the rule book. And now before, I, before anybody does anything, I can, you know, look at this. Um, you know, the the Lee Street uh, project that NHS did, and uh, Jim was on the architectural review committee. Mm -hmm. You know, these are 26 lots that uh, that um, Saha owned, and they had an architectural guideline for them. It said you're going to have an eight foot deep porch, right? It's going to be at least 50 percent of your house. So that, that's, here's here's the rule book, guys. Design within these parameters. Submit it to us, and now we we kind of we're all starting on the same page, right? And so. It's when we're so far off 
that it's just so hard to come back together, you know. And um, I think you, I think as a as a small developer, that would be something I would be fully in support of. And I think it would, as a neighborhood, give you a, a say before the project is even conceived to say, you know, this is kind of what makes our neighborhood special, right? These are the things we find important, and and if you'll if you'll play within this rule book, then we'll support it. If you don't, then we're going to go to zoning and we're going to fight. We're going to go to the next step and we're going to fight. And we've got a we've got a process to go through that, right? If if we can go and do all those things, and if two people just totally disagree, we have a mechanism to solve it. But it doesn't. Every project doesn't have to be that way. And I think some planning on the forefront would be instrumental in helping to prevent those really visceral, you know, confrontations there. So I think we've got a couple of architects on the panel that might have some thoughts along these lines. David, do you want to jump in on this one? Well, I, I, I do find it's interesting that it's coming back and back and back always to design and to design quality. And, and there are different views of what constitutes good design. Uh, to the neighbors that live on the street, five towering houses on one lot is not good design. It's not the design that fits their neighborhood. Um, could there be a, a, a guidebook or rule book or design guidelines? Absolutely, there could be. They're difficult to write. You know, they're, they're difficult to enforce. They're difficult to interpret. Um, but ultimately, that's what the UDC and the zoning does. It's, it's telling you what you can do on these, on these different zone properties. Um, that's what NCD, Neighborhood Conservation District, uh, design standards do is they tell you beyond what, what the UDC zoning requirements are, what are the design standards for the different types of properties. And that's what the Historic District Design Guidelines do also. They, they guide you more in guidelines toward, toward design solutions. Um, and the thing I like about those is they involve the public input, the public input process into the NCD uh, standards that uh, some of the neighborhoods are going through uh, updates right now. Uh, our neighborhood just did that in CD2. And um, we think it's going to improve and m bring clarity to, to what development types can take place. Um, historic districts or designated historic districts and the Rio districts are all subject to historic district uh, guidelines and and the HDRC review, which again is a public forum. It's not where everything should be uh, battled out. I agree there should be more consensus and and pre meetings that that help that go smoothly. But it is at least a public forum where we have public voices and. I was um, in one of the working groups that was predominantly, I would say, um, for the Mayor's Housing Policy Task Force that was really dominated by uh, developers. And, um, you know, the interesting thing that I um, noticed during the course of many of the discussions um, was that what, what many developers are looking for, which I think I've heard from y'all, is just predictability. You know, and when you go into these, these, these projects and you don't know how much money you're going to spend when you start digging that hole, um, and you don't know what the neighborhood reaction is going to be, um, you don't know all of these, these questions, the answers to all these questions, um, you know, ultimately that, that creates an incentive for the alternative, which is sprawl. Um, and, um, you know, I think that there are some historic reasons that these older neighborhoods, particularly neighborhoods of color, do not trust any government process. You know, there's there's um, yeah. there's a reason that there hasn't been that kind of um, discussion. But you know, there are alternatives to the kind of Byzantine zoning. Um, that we currently have, um, like form-based codes, like by right zoning, where the community could come together, write a set of guidelines that are very clear about what the community will accept and what, um, you know, the geometry of, of the different lots, um, but it's done in a positive way rather than a negative way, which our current zoning does which is say, you can't do this, you can't do that, you, you know, and it can, 
give a level of predictability, I think, to developers, and then it also will make sure that these communities have a voice and that the result is something that everybody can at least live with and if not, love. So. Anissa? I, I think that um, predictability would be helpful on both ends. Um, and, and I think you're right about your point about trust. Um, I think there needs to be more transparency um, on the part of the city, um, probably for, for both ends of it. You know, um, I've heard of developers saying, I've heard a developer in my living room, not you, say, <laughs> say that they weren't allowed to do zone, a certain um, thing with the zoning they had that I know for a fact they could do because I've read the zoning code and they were told at a zoning hearing that they couldn't do it because of the code. And, and I think that that lack of transparency is confusing for developers. The, the rules are changing on you all the time. Um, and, then, and then the lack of transparency and, and the lack of trust um, on the part of the community where we don't know if the city is gonna help us. We don't know if our representative is gonna listen to us or if they're working with the developer. We don't know if they're, if they're trying to get this built or if they're trying to preserve something. We, we really don't know. And, and there's no good way for us to find that out. And um, we, we need that transparency. We need to be able to trust. We need to rebuild that trust. And I think that um, something like you mentioned, um, that form-based zoning where we could, if the community could have a voice in creating that and be a part of that and say, this is what my neighborhood wants. This is what my neighborhood is like. And this is what's important to us. And having those rules or guidelines out there and saying, this is the kind of development we want. Um, these are the things that would work for us is going to really open that dialogue and that communication and then it's going to work well for both sides so that when someone is looking at buying a property they could say oh okay this is this is what could be built on this property that's what I do I can build that so since we're on kind of this subject of resolution of at least that component we obviously haven't solved the overarching economic issues here today but it, we're making some headway on the phys, kind of the physical form Liz I'd like to hear about hear from you on this and and Peter I'd like to get your take on this too um yeah, this is good ideas and it's all good things. The reason that I initially said, uh, oh, that's not going to happen, is it's short-sighted and not really what I believe because I want to I always continue to have the conversation like we're adults and we can find a compromise. Um, going back to Dignity Hill, and three years ago, and that and may change because that's what change is about. A fresh set of eyes looking at something and saying, you know what, this was good three and a half years ago, but it may not be relevant today. But the point that I'm trying to make is we published three, the, the ARC at the time published three uh, position statements, demolition, development, and density. And we painstakingly went and ensured that the units per acre never interfered with your ability as a developer to take advantage of the incentives. Okay? That was the number one thing. Um, and the number two thing is, especially in Dignity Hill, it's a mile. It's at least 1,600 rooftops. Um, we still got 170 vacant lots. So to some degree, I feel like, and I think many feel like that with me, not all, but that we're stuck. We're stuck like Chuck. You want to do this, you're going to do this, no matter what. And that requires, but on the same token, you don't feel like that when you come into a community. You're like, I don't know how it's going to go. But I will tell you this right now, John Cooley, you do not take all the risk. No, I agree. You got a better risk than I do. One risk that I'm going to take is, will, is how long do I stay and can I continue to afford that? You take a risk because if you use the, even the basis for this conversation and a million new people coming into San Antonio, 
I don't care if they stay vacant for six months. I don't want that for you, but somebody's going to buy them. Or you'll reduce the price and somebody's going to say, that's an incredible deal. We are all taking a risk, whether we stay the same or we try yeah, to Yeah, we're, we're in the same boat. You know, we're, we're all trying to figure out how these million people are going to fit. And, you know, and, and I applaud putting together the guidelines for the neighborhood and, you know, and looking at the densities that are required to, to hit those incentives. You know, I think it, it has to be both sides of the table coming together and producing something like that. I, it, you know, to some degree, every neighborhood's going to be responsible for, for being part of this overall solution of where these people are going to go. Right. I mean, and it can't be done in isolation where it's just we'd like things to stay the same. You know, that that can't be the status quo. We, we know the math, the numbers just say we're going to just keep growing out into the suburbs. Right. We're just going to keep paving over our fields. And that's the that's the alternative unless. Hey, John, yeah. we're, we're starting to run out of okay. time. I want to give Peter just like 60 seconds. Can you pack it in? Yes. All right. Um, so certainty, that's something that's really important. These processes are very subjective. I made the observation the other day that we took a uh, hundred plus million dollar building um, to the HDRC and the case immediately before ours was a front yard fence in King William. So the same body, and that was pulled off the consent agenda, by the way. <laughs> the fence? The fence, yeah. the fence, because <laughs> is it five feet or four feet? I got to know because this could ruin my property value. And then we have this, you know, hundred million dollar building coming up next. So it seems odd to me at the development side that that, those two same things would happen in front of the same body at the same time in the same day. Um, so that is about certainty right there and not knowing what the rules are and how the rules can change. The other thing, and it just comes back to this, is as you said, Liz, there's 170 vacant lots. Um, the, the path of development is going to be fairly predictable. It's going to start closer to the center or closer to some source of energy. And that is the place where more density is going to be desired. And then it's going to, it's going to have a natural... There's this concept of the transect, this natural uh, sort of transition back into where single family begins again. And that has to be a thing that we accept inside 410. I mean, that has to be a way that we look at every single neighborhood. And by, by making, uh, enshrining every single neighborhood into uh, a historic district or some kind of overlay district that only allows for single family homes is only going to drive prices up. And, and you can look at markets all across the country that prove this. Now, it may take a really long time, to your point, but that is the outcome, that people will be priced out. It'll just happen slowly instead of quickly. And then the only people that live there are a million dollars like 25 years, King Wing. There you go. <laughs> okay, great. Thank you all. This has been great. I think um, we're going to wrap up that kind of uh, portion of the program and take a few minutes just to take some more random questions from the audience. Okay, here we go. Do you believe that refusing to increase density in the urban core and historic neighborhoods exacerbates exclusionary housing practices and drive up, drives up home prices and rents? Please explain. I think Peter just answered that question. Okay. Wouldn't it be more effective and benefit more to have a comprehensive policy that acknowledges the importance of view sheds to the value of properties and have it at least considered in approving developments. Who wants to tackle that one? I've been talking a lot, but I've been attending the Viewshed meetings and, <laughs> uh, and, and if, unless there's anybody else who wants to jump in on this. Um, no, is the short answer. We're a 300 year old city. Uh, we know what's really valuable to us. We ought to be able to pick what it is today. It's, is it 100 years old? Is it 75 years old? Have we been honoring it and loving it since the city existed? If not, then that's not a thing. Um, I, I think the view shed is, an, again, another way to uh, cool uh, development, and I think it's been used in a certain instance as a way to try to stop a development outright. And the Hay Street Bridge uh, view shed is totally different than the District 7 view shed that's been proposed or, or many of the others. And you can't have a view of it from a thing. It's gotta be the view to a thing. I mean, there are things that, that we wanna value and but we should know what they are and we shouldn't be able to continue to keep adding it and use it as another tool to stop development. Okay, well this, this is a rich one. Does anyone else wanna? Oh, view shed? 
go. Come on, get up there, Ashley. Come on, Ruby City, Ashley, Ruby City. Uh, yeah. Don't get me started. Well, I would agree that if you're going to do a view shed, um, you need to pick a point, and it's a view, you know, it's a basically a sort of a conical projection from a point, right? I mean, down in Southtown, there is a, um, a new museum that's going up, and it's not even, it doesn't even, this hasn't opened, you know, it's just been uh, topped out, it ha it's not even a complete building yet, and we're already talking about um, view sheds to that um, museum. So, you know, I, I think that um, there are definitely some things in San Antonio that make it special um, and that we need to protect um, for many reasons. Um, but, yeah, it should not be used as a weapon against, um, against development um, in the downtown area. Liz, did you want to chime in on that one? I know you've been real involved over there sure. on Pace um, Street. Boy, that's a tricky one. I had a view when I got there. Ten years later, I don't have a view. Um, but I agree with both Peter and Ashley. Um, because the view shed and the protection of that can't be the stick that I use rather than to, to try and make a better argument or challenge a particular development. I need to do my homework a little bit more. Saying that someday it might impede that view, which is, I had to learn the hard way. Uh, I, a lot of this stuff I learned the hard way because I don't really want to know it. <laughs> but I'm stuck knowing it now because you can't look stupid when you walk up to somebody. But that's my own bag. But view shed protection is different than the historic structure. And we should be it, 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 there shouldn't be that much debate about it. You know, there are, there are specific things in San Antonio that you recognize in a picture, whether you see it in somebody's house in New York or New Jersey or here in town, you, you just crossed over it. But as a tool to um, hamper development, no, I don't think it's a good one. It's, it's weak, really. It's, it means we're not really having an in-depth conversation about how we can get closer to a solution, so. All right, great, well thank you. Um, we have another question here. Uh, I, I like this one, uh, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna add a little to it. So I've been looking at a lot of data over the last eight months through the Mayor's Housing Policy Task Force, and you know we've discovered a lot of the things we discovered in the 2013 Housing Needs Assessment, which is that we need a lot of affordable housing in San Antonio, right? Um, and a lot of it for the very poorest San Antonians. So, um, with an evident lack of affordable housing, why does the city continue to push for luxury and market rate housing, giving these projects large incentives? Where are we supposed to live when almost all housing has become unaffordable? Who wants to take that one? I guess the C chip and TERS would be kind of what they're. Yeah, well, what they're and tax abatements yeah, think, and on and on and on. I think on. the city's yeah. responsibility is to incentivize what makes sense and what it what it is trying to accomplish. And I think there are parts of the city where, you know, does the C-chip need to exist by the pearl? You know, mission accomplished, right? Like there's, there's probably not a lot of incentive that needs to happen there. Um, and I think what it did was really fantastic, right? It, it produced a lot of downtown revitalization in a lot of ways. It made a lot of projects, it closed a lot of gaps for a lot of people to do projects that were successful. Um, but I think now it just needs to be you know, folk refocused on a, a different challenge, right? And that's, I think, the, the next goal. It comes back into our affordable housing program. Can you use something like that to help promote those types of projects? So let me kind of ask this an another way, because it's a question, it's a very common question. You know, it's one of the big questions we're all grappling with right now. I think council is going to you know, hear a revised proposal from Center City Development Office sometime in the next uh, a month or two uh, regarding the incentive packages. I think the overarching question is, and, and I have my own opinion on this, but I, I want to hear it from you guys. Why would the city spend money to incentivize luxury housing knowing that we have an affordable housing issue? 
And, it, and there's, a, there's a good answer there. And it, it, it may not be satisfactory for everyone, but Peter, I think you can probably. Well, okay, so I'm, I'm of the belief that every new unit of housing in a trickle-down way produces a unit of affordable housing. So the numbers, now that's, again, this is a long slog. We are 157, 160,000 units shy on the affordable housing side. And so it, I understand it seems today very difficult to understand how 300 units of $3 a foot apartments do anything to remedy that, but they do. There is a, there's a, a sort of a move up or move down effect um, a, across the housing space and every new unit of housing, we need basically, we need to add housing in all sides. It's the easiest thing to incentivize. There's another answer, which is again, not a very good answer. So why are we doing it? Is because it's an easy thing to do. Um, I think the other thing uh, uh, that this comes back to the suburban versus urban deal, that incentivizing urban luxury housing is a better bet for the city's dollars than, than not incentivizing suburban sprawl. You don't have to incentivize that. The market, all the forces, all the reasons that we've talked about, make it easier to do, encourage people to do it, and they're going to do it all, all over the place. And it actually saves the city money to have you know, new $3 apartments downtown um, as opposed to building, you know, more single family homes in the burbs. I'm not sure I'm quite getting to the heart of this. I mean, I let, guess me, let me take a crack at it. Just, okay. just real quick. Let me, let me Tell try. Tell us the answer, Jim. Well, okay. So I was part of the economic, uh, uh, analysis team that developed the strategic downtown framework, um, you know, and, and looked at, you know, what we would need to do to get some investment south of 410. And what we determined was more or less every dollar that the city spends on downtown San Antonio, it gets $7 back in return, right? And I think the big idea from the beginning was that all of that extra cash was going to go back into infrastructure for downtown and for the neighborhoods that surround downtown, and it was all going to be great. Well, that's kind of not what's happened, uh, but I think that that's never. the real overarching answer. That's never, that's Kind of not what's happened ever, right? Right. Okay. Yeah. I'd say well, one. Other although, although uh, that's not quite true. Um, you know, in our last our last bond issue, there's some fairly significant projects for for right downtown. I guess one other thing, and that is the idea of inclusionary zoning, where in every new luxury project, you should also build affordable units. That is, in my opinion, the least good use of dollars, because those units are the most expensive to build, and you're going to get the fewest units for your bucks. So stabilizing housing, you know, the, the state of our housing stock across most of the city is not great. And stabilizing that housing, which is already de facto affordable housing, is, is you're going to get a lot more bang for your dollars that way than attaching five units in the next 350-unit luxury project. Peter, that's a fantastic point. So should the city be spending any dollars at all? subsidizing luxury apartments or or should they be taking those dollars and go putting them into projects where they can get affordable housing? I think that's, I mean, that's where we are now. That's what we need. Yeah. Okay, great. Let's take another question. All right. There are many abandoned buildings around town, most of which are the result of companies... Uh, outsourcing their operations. San Antonio is growing, but why are so many of these vacant buildings not being redeveloped to generate revenue for our city? And that's tricky. Cost. Seems to me like it's the focus, because if I'm going to apply the incentive, there's no incentive for you to rehab the building. There's an incentive for Peter or John to come in and do new development, even in the commercial sector, I'm sure it's the same. The incentives are focused on the development as opposed to the rehabilitation. That's what I see. Okay, great. You're taking this. Okay. I'm sorry. Was there another? No. All right. How do you think single-family manufactured homes, including mobile homes, fit in helping fill vacant or dilapidated properties currently zoned for single-family homes, not mobile homes? Very good question. Again, <laughs> too many vacant lots, not enough affordable homes. Manufactured housing, mobile homes are affordable homes. Um, you know, there's all sorts of quality standards. I mean, they're not the thing they used to be. 
and the zoning laws that preclude them are more about race than about the people, than about the homes themselves, period. And all this redlining stuff that's created a whole lot of our zoning just isn't, isn't applicable anymore. So there's a way to make them look sharp. You know, go look at Clayton's homes. They've got actually really nice looking stuff. They yeah. do. And it's, and it's way less expensive than John or I can produce a housing unit and we need it. So maybe it's not the permanent solution, but it should be part of the solution. How do, how do ADUs fix into that? I know that's something you've gone a lot. Oh, I'll well, definitely go for that. So, Where's, what's yeah. the status of that in the city? Well, I, I think there should be, you know, again, the cheapest lot to build on is one that already exists, right? So if you can build on a lot that has a home on it in the back of the house, you're not doing a lot of the infrastructure, the water meter's there, the electricity's there, et cetera, et cetera, the driveway's so just, there. Just to clarify, ADU, he's talking about an accessory dwelling unit or a granny flat, a detached smaller structure from your main house on your lot. Yeah, we should we should encourage that in every single family zone, and I think we should do away with the with the prohibition against um, uh, against renting that unit. I think that's off base. If that's a way for someone to have extra income to stay in their primary house, they should be allowed to do that. And we should also do away with the forty percent of the primary homestead rule um, because we need more of these things. Again, it's the least expensive kind of housing we can build, and it's on lots that have already been built and already exist. Ashley? Yeah, I mean, I, I think accessory dwelling units are a, a fantastic um, tool that we can use to start to address these um, issues that we have of, with affordable housing um, for all the reasons that you mentioned. And it really uh, um, it goes to a certain um, um, demographic and, and market sector that is underserved. You know, if you're looking at the ability for people to age in place with their families, and you're looking at students. Are you looking at people who are maybe not ready for um, the the 2,400 square foot house, or the you know it's it's a it's a wonderful thing, and um, all the infrastructure is there. It also provides um, it, it will increase uh, the number of people that we have in those areas that are already um, very popular. So it would make our public transportation system a, a lot more viable. And this, I think this is going to be the last question, and it's a really good one. So let's hear what everyone has to say on it. Well, I, I was David? just going to add to that about ex, uh, accessory detached dwelling units is that they're, they're <laughs> typically behind the, the building in the front. And so there, there's a way to increase density in our, our historic neighborhoods, and I don't mean just the designated historic districts, but all of our neighborhoods have an opportunity to, to add density in a way that really would be sight unseen density. It's, it's, it's out of view of the public realm, and so it doesn't change the character of your streetscape, uh, especially if you have trees, you know, that you don't even see down the driveway, you, the, the unit in the back. Um, they can even be taller because of the view shed or view up that you would see um, a taller building behind it, you know, until it's two stories in front of a one story, usually from the street. So. <laughs> So I, I agree with a lot of the things said here tonight about that. Anissa? Um, I was going to say basically that, but also um, it's, it's actually, it exists a lot in the city already. It's one of the historical development patterns that we see in a lot of the older neighborhoods. Um, and I think a lot of neighborhood and community members would be behind that kind of development. Um, it does help people stay in their homes. There's a, a lady on my street that's in her 80s, and she rents her little back house, and the guy helps her you know, around the house so she can stay independent as well, so. Um, hopefully we've touched on some challenging subjects. There's clearly some things that we need to go a lot deeper into. I, for one, would like to start seeing us having regular conversations of this, na of this nature and bringing in more community members from all of the, the inner city neighborhoods, more development entities, and let's just start a larger conversation and, and keep this rolling and see if we can develop a bucket of solutions that, you know, that, that we as kind of fellow citizens and neighbors uh, together can live with. So thank you all for coming out. And thanks to our panel. We will be getting together at a place called Alita. It's about half a mile walk away um, on El Paso Street. So if anyone wants to continue this conversation, um, meet some of the board members of the organizations, or if any of the panelists are coming, you know, get a chance to talk to them, uh, we'd be happy to have you. There'll be some uh, food and uh, beer and other beverages provided 
uh, at no charge. So uh, hope to see you there. And there's also a survey. Um, please tell us uh, how we did. Um, if, if you know, if you want to try and be on one of these panels, um, that we'd love to have you. So yeah, let us know uh, at the the link on the up there. Thank you. <laughs>